Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome to this ECP event on Germany's soft power 2030. I'm Melinda Crane, senior political analyst at Deutsche Welle, and on behalf of our hosts, the Hertie School and the Institute for Auslandsbeziehungen, IFA, it is a great pleasure to accompany you today as moderator. The term soft power, as many of you undoubtedly know, was coined by Harvard professor Joe Nye just after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And interestingly enough, it's a term with which the German government has never been all that comfortable, as I think Helmut Anheyer will uh, uh, also remind us of a little bit later on. Nonetheless, External, educational, and cultural policy have been a key pillar of German outreach during the entire post-Cold War period. That period, as we knew it, or as we thought we knew it, came to an end in February with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and with Chancellor Scholz's landmark speech in which he declared that a Zeiten Wende was at hand. Germany clearly possesses significant soft power potential at this critical juncture in history. It's not only the EU's most populous member state and also one of the world's largest economies, it consistently scores pretty high on international rankings of the world's most trusted countries. To realize that potential, to shape the tools and instruments of educational and cultural policy to maximum effect, clearly it's imperative to understand the goals that they could serve and also the context in which they would be deployed. And that is anything but self-evident, which is why the subtitle of tonight's event is Scenarios for an Unsettled World. To explore possible contexts and goals, researchers working with the Hertie School and IFA's External Cultural Policy Monitor, ECP for short, have developed four scenarios outlining potential paths for future German foreign cultural policy. We're going to hear more about their findings in just a moment. Allow me just a very quick word on our agenda. We'll begin with welcome remarks on behalf of our hosts and organizers. Senior Professor Helmut Anheyer will then follow and present the Soft Power 2030 study. And following that, our outstanding panel will join us here on stage to explore the researchers' findings and their implications. And we're also very eager to hear from you, ladies and gentlemen. We will definitely take your questions toward the latter part of our discussion. And now, it is my great pleasure to hand over to the Vice Secretary General of the Institute for Auslandsbeziehungen, Sebastian Kerber. The floor is yours. Thank you, Melinda Crane. Dear guests, distinguished speakers, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's discussion about Germany's soft power policy 2030 scenarios for an unsettled world. The IFA is a cultural institute being engaged in international cultural relations for more than 100 years now. We support artistic exchange, civil societies around the world, and act as a center for competence on culture and foreign policy. We as a cultural institute see culture and foreign policy as an opportunity of exchange, common learning and debate on global challenges, fundamental values and local needs. In general, cultural organizations in the field of international cultural relations hesitate to understand culture as a tool for political purposes, but have rather a vision of culture for its own sake and international cultural relations as form of cooperation among equal partners. However, the current discourse after the Russian invasion of the Ukraine changed also the cultural community towards a more strategic and political charge debate, not only vis-a-vis -vis the inclusion and cooperation with artists from Russia, but also regarding the cultural security nexus. Putin's war shattered a European and international peace architecture that had taken decades to build. 
the historic shift, the Zeitenwende of Chancellor Olaf Scholz stated, um, has the Zeitenwende, as uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz stated, has already and will increasingly have an enormous impact on culture and international relations and foreign policy. We are witnessing the end of an exceptional phase of globalization and have to adjust to changing realities. We have to learn that investing in energy independence is, li is linked to security questions. We have to develop tools to protect our open societies, defend democ democratic values, and strengthen our alliances and partnerships, and build new partnerships, as, as Chancellor Scholz suggests. Many countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America have their own demand for resources, goods, and services, and a stronger role in global affairs, cooperate more closely with democratic democracies outside the West, according to Scholz, is a way to keep multilateralism alive in a new multipolar world. Possible scenarios of the impact of this shift of the Zeitenwende were drafted and analyzed by Professor Anheyer and his team in the Foresight project, which will be presented tonight. We are very excited to hear about the results. This foresight project is part of the External Cultural Policy Monitor, which was developed by the, by the Hertie School and IFA one year ago. The monitor covers the external cultural policy strategies of around 45 countries so far and summarizes specific topics in comparative reports and data presentations. We are convinced that we need research and data which describe the status quo of international cultural relations including the views and needs of partners and partner countries to better design and implement foreign cultural policy. IFA supports uh, independent research on topics of international cultural relations and provides spaces to discuss the findings with a wider audience. On a new online platform forum, <clears throat> on our new online platform forum for international cultural relations, IFA offers research-based knowledge at the interface of science and practice from the field of foreign cultural policy and international cultural relations. Today, we are very happy to be able to share and discuss the research finding with you. Before handing over to the host of today's discussion, Melinda Crane, I would like to thank the Hertie School, Professor Anheyer and his team for this cooperation their dedication to this project and their excellent work. Thank you very much for sharing your findings and expertise with us. I'm looking forward to a lively and maybe controversial debate now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian Kerber, for your words of greeting. And as we just heard there, the uh, external um, cultural policy monitor was launched this spring for the purpose of analyzing cultural policy strategies across Europe. And at that time, when it was launched, our next speaker emphasized the crucial importance of evidence-based policy making, particularly at a time when geopolitical tensions and turbulence are on the rise. We hear more now on what that turbulence could mean for Germany's soft power. It is a very great pleasure to hand over to Hertie's senior professor of sociology and past president, Helmut Anheyer, who will now present the foresight scenarios. Welcome, Helmut. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Melinda. Perhaps you could you drop the senior? when you introduce me next. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think this, uh, this project has a, a, a history that uh, started before uh, the uh, invasion uh, of uh, Putin's army of Ukraine, and it, uh, it has shifted and changed uh, quite a bit. But the, the spirit by which it was carried out um, comes very clearly through two uh, citations that I would like to share with you. Uh, and uh, I think nobody put the situation in which Germany is now better than uh, Constanze Stelzenmüller at Brookings Institute. At Brookings Institute, she said at the Financial Times just very recently that um, 
Germany outsourced its security to the United States, its export-led uh, growth to China, and its energy needs to Russia. And I think that really sums up a very short-sighted uh, foreign policy view, and we were trying to make sense of what that means now for, for soft power. And Norbert Röttgen, uh, who many of you, of course, know, and now a member of parliament with uh, the CDU, uh, he said in his recent book, um, we should have known, but we didn't want to know. It was all there to see in plain sight, but we didn't want to see it. All right? So there has been a certain short-sightedness when it comes to um, German foreign policy. I know that's a controversial statement to make, but I think this is a time of reckoning, and we should be uh, honest and speak our mind. And when we talk about Seitenwende, we should be... Um, we should know what we're actually talking about. And it has become, for those of you who listen to the news today, it has become the word of the year. Um, and it's um, characteristic, I think, of the kind of soul searching that goes on at the moment in many policy circles. So our little project here is, is part of that. I, we try to understand uh, what the changes uh, mean that we are now observing um, when, it, when we look at geopolitics, but also divergent global scenarios, uh, what does that then mean for possible cultural or soft power approaches for, for Germany? That was the focus, and we said, why don't we aim for the year 2030? Right? And before um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, before I go into this, this uh, goes in and out all the time, that's why. Um, it is uh, kind of hard to have a fluent presentation. This is Matt. Yeah. So I look, I look at that in the meantime. Um, what role will Germans, that uh, goes dark all the time. Uh, what, what role will German uh, uh, soft power uh, play in, in the future? And we have a foresight project, a scenario project. I'll explain more about uh, that in, in a moment, where we uh, try to uh, anticipate possible futures and what their implications are for soft power approaches and then what policy recommendations could we uh, possibly make. And we use the term soft power uh, synonymous with the other terms that you see there. And I think in the context in which we um, uh, employ it, you, you see which reference we are, are making. But... Uh, as Melinda said, soft power was introduced, uh, the notion of soft power was introduced by Joe Nye some time ago, and um, it, in, in, in very simple terms, it is kind of an, a, a foreign policy approach that makes, uh, with the aim of uh, making other countries like us, right? So they have a positive feeling and a kind of a mutual understanding of us, and the idea is that this approach opens up space in which you can debate, in which you can cooperate. Right? And uh, Joe and I contrasted that with uh, sharp power. And sharp power means that we create dependencies, and if a country does not, in a way, behave the way we would like, we can inflict pain. Right? And that's exactly what Putin did uh, with us, because we developed a dependency, or let a dependency develop as you can see here. And then we have a sharp, a hard power, and of course that's the, uh, very understandable. And by the way, if you allow me a personal footnote, uh, I actually served in the 142nd uh, tank battalion, and my job with these guys, as you see in the Leopard 2, was to um, uh, monitor the failure rate of tanks and make suggestions as to how you could improve the maintenance. Right? And that's when I discovered my love of evidence-based policies. And, uh, uh, and, so, and then uh, I know this is a controversial picture, and uh, I didn't find a better one of the National Security Council in, in action. So sharp power is the smart combination. Uh, 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 smart power is the skillful combination of different sources of power. And, of course, that picture was taken when... Uh, President Obama ordered the assassination of uh, Osama bin Laden. But the point I was making here um, is 
that, that Germany has no national security council and, uh, or similar institution, and Ambassador Wolfgang Ischinger has for years argued for one. And I think we are also going to end up arguing for the establishment of a national security council to better coordinate the other sources of power. Right? So let's have a quick look at German soft power approaches. So before the war with Ukraine, this is what German soft power was, what it tried to, uh, to do. Um, it was based on the principle of ever deeper uh, integration with the European Union, transatlanticism, a belief in the smoothing, soothing power of Wandel durch Handel. Now, very, very controversial, but that was really a very driving idea for a very, very long time, right? And it was, the, it was German industry driving this more than German politics. And, uh, and also we have to be very clear that it was very often not the German parliament or politicians that were driving Nord Stream 2 on 1. It was the interest of very large German corporations. So uh, sharp power and hard power and soft power are very often related through stakeholder interests that are domestic interests as well. And then, very, very important, is a, uh, a restraint in all military matters. And in terms of soft power, we aim to uh, strengthen international dialogue, opening political and pre political space, promoting democracy and, and human rights. And that has, of course, changed in course of the Russian aggression. Now, if what Chancellor Scholz said in his speech in February, if that is really Im being implemented, then Germany would not only be the largest economic power in Europe, right? it would also be the largest military power in, in Europe. And we need to start thinking about the implications of that, knowing that this country is deeply pacifist. Right? It's not at all a bellicose country, but it has now the uncomfortable task of coming to terms with the changed reality. And there was no debate. There was no debate in Parliament and the public about increasing the size of the federal army. But so what does that mean for soft power approaches? So in the report that is actually available already, we go into some statistics. And what we have in, um, in the German case is a this is almost impossible to do, I'm afraid, because um, it comes in and out. But um, why don't I take a mic yeah. and uh, do it like this from here? Apologies that uh, we're actually very professional that I go to school normally. But um, you got this? Okay. So um, uh, what we have is a really quite impressive uh, system a soft power system, right, where we maintain one of the largest networks of international exchanges worldwide. We have uh, the German language ranking four in the number of languages being taught, and the numbers have been increasing. We have the network of schools that has expanded in recent years and is widely regarded as a very successful instrument and also of attracting talent uh, to Germany. We have science diplomacy, where Germany ranks among the top in science diplomacy internationally. And we have, uh, in the foreign and social media sphere, we have Deutsche Welle as one of the largest media institutions in the world. So, so Germany is actually quite well positioned, right, in terms of soft power instruments. But the question is, is that positioning adequate for a world that could be quite different in future? And that was what we tried to um, fathom in this project that uh, we now look more uh, into. So government support for German soft power is two billion. Uh, two billion buys you just a bit more than two stealth bombers, right? So it is a lot of money, but then compared to what we sp what is spent on hard power, it's relatively uh, little. So let me say something about the foresight project. Um, this is probably a bit too small for you to see. Um, a uh, foresight project or scenario planning is as much a social science as it is, uh, you might say, art or the uh, skillful interpretation of possible um, 
uh, futures or exploration of uh, futures that uh, Kotama, that's very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, so we, we started by setting up uh, the theme, and the theme was what are possible projections of German soft power in the year 2030? We did a literature review. We had uh, various brainstorming sessions. We uh, looked at what other scenarios are out there, have been conducted, can we learn from them? Right? And we started uh, a survey. We sent out a survey to um, over, I think, almost 300 uh, experts that we identified, members of parliament. But very direction. Okay. But the screen is working again. Yeah. Oh, the screen is working. Okay. So let me go back to the screen. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's easier. So we did um, send out a survey and we got uh, about, I think, 70 responses. And we used those surveys also to validate our own thinking. We um, then um, started to identify drivers. So drivers are those really big developments that um, help shape the future. Right? And once we identified the drivers, we began to develop a first narratives. So what, what does it actually mean if the world goes into that direction? Right? And we mapped out uh, the implications, discussed policy recommendations. And at that point, it's a bit of a back and forth. Right? This chart suggests that it's a very straight way of doing it, but you, you circle around a lot. Right? And the, the notion that we try to have at a, a later on, or notions, are contrasting views of the world's future. And in that, we then map scenarios. Right? So uh, among the many drivers that we considered or that could possibly come into uh, into um, scope here, we settled uh, in the end on two. And one is the state of the world economy, and the other one is the geopolitical uh, situation. And you can sum uh, simplify it, say, uh, would we have a situation where we have more economic growth, and it's more so more even economic growth, or less of it? And do we have more? international tensions or fewer international tensions. Right? And that gave us these four scenarios, and I'm just going to walk you uh, through each of them. We start with what is the most positive one, where we have a rapprochement uh, between uh, China and the United States, and they, they find a minimal ground of international corporations around global public goods. And that means that tensions are significantly reduced, Right? And we have a more positive sum world. And that means that, that Germany can probably operate very, pretty much the way um, within the EU, right? It, 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 the changes are not that big in this kind of a world. And, and then we have the Cold War 2.0 scenario, which sees tensions between the US and China rising, reaching all-time high by 2030. Uh, that means that uh, we will also have significant competition in terms of technology and economic and uh, other aspects. So we have a full-blown system rivalry. And in this case, we have shifts in the world economy that uh, supply chains are either going to China or they are going towards uh, Europe and the United States. So it's a bit of a bifurcation. And the, um, the EU, and uh, with that Germany, leans more towards the United States. So there's a bit of a separation. And it, hard, it could be a rocky few years for the German economy to dissociate itself from China. But in the medium term, uh, it is a positive sum world. And people, uh, it is an, another positive sum world. But it's, it's actually... A, uh, a lot of growth potential for the economy. And uh, then we have the scenario of what we call the acrimonious globalization. And here we have two competing blocks. So it's not only China and the US, but it's more, it's more the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, and the NATO plus Euro bloc on, on the other. And in this acrimonious Globalization, we do indeed have a zero-sum game. Uh, we have lots of tensions, 
and uh, we have less uh, economic uh, growth. And finally, we have the regressive globalization scenario where we have multiple blocks, so we don't have the two blocks, but we have multiple, and they all trade with each other on their own terms. So it's almost like we like globalization as long as it benefits us. Right? And that is um, an, a world where we, base, where we have a lot of um, emphasis on the national interest. And what we get at most are regional uh, trading blocks, but we do not get larger configurations. And here, too, the situation is that China and the U.S. have failed to come up with a workable cooperation model. And what are the implications? Um, well, for this Sino-American rapprochement, it's really continuity. Right? And uh, Germany could make science diplomacy a big part of it because the there will be a lot of competition around technology and advances also in the digital world. Right? So the PASH network could be there. Uh, I think the Goethe Institute could operate the way it, it does now, focusing on language education a lot, probably more than it uh, does, does now. In Cold War 2.0, that changes drastically. We have a geopolitical logic of a post blocks, and that, that strains many of the assumptions that we could still make under the Sino American rapprochement. The spaces to operate are rapidly disappearing, and um, I think Germany will be challenged uh, to operate uh, such that um, alliances with non aligned countries are, are possible. And we call that friend shoring. So we try to reach out to countries, knowing that we can't really reach out into to, to China. We try to lure countries into uh, an alliance more with the United States and, and Europe. In acrimonious deglobalization, we have an unstable, competitive international environment. And given that it's such a tense environment, Given that it's such an economically challenging environment, it is quite likely that there will be a lot of pressure on soft power approaches in Germany to be fully integrated into defense, security, and trade policies. So under acrimonious globalization, we see the least amount of independence on behalf of the uh, intermediary institutions like Goethe or the DAD and so on. Right. So uh, we also have the problem in that scenario that, of course, other countries try to reach into Germany as well. So we would have to have a very close eye to what happens at the Russian house next door in that scenario, right? which at the moment we really don't. And, and then we have the regressive globalization scenario. And here it is really economic interests that push uh, German soft power approaches. Right there, right? There, there is a bit of more uh, leeway to operate, but um, there will be a lot of pressure to show uh, impact. There will be uh, discussions about KPIs. There will be discussions about strategic uh, plans and uh, objectives and, and so on. So uh, that would also be a challenging time for soft power because it will be under the overarching national interest of advancing the country's economic position. What are the recommendations? We make many recommendations in the report. I'm just focusing on the most important ones here. Um, in the Sino-American one, it is to rebuild, to build its reputation, credibility with both the United States and China. Uh, Germany can do a lot in helping shape norms in, um, let's say, the world of social media, but also in biotechnology. Right? It is a more peaceful world here, but it's still a very competitive world, and with many advances in technology possible, Germany could play a very, very important role here. Um, in Cold War II, uh, diffuse tensions. I think um, making sure that uh, soft power does, in a way, its job, and uh, creates these 
avenues for dialogue and uh, trust building measures should be possible. Uh, and ECP is probably part of these friend shoring strategies that target uh, specific countries or regions that are highly relevant for security. Right? Um, a, a good example of friend shoring were the uh, America houses in, in Germany in the 1950s onward. Right? That was really uh, to create a positive image of the United States in, in, in Germany where many people were not so sure. Right? And it was a great success. Then we have acrimonious deglobalization. As in the other scenario, you have to diffuse tensions and encourage dialogue and trust building. And here we think that we should establish a joint council. So the National Security Council, or whatever you call it, but something that I don't think we have today. And I talked to various ministries and people in parliament in the last few months. We, we do not have something like the American National Security Council. And, and in the acrimonious deglobalization scenario, that is what we would have to have. And the regressive globalization means that we really have to strengthen the pro, uh, activities with our European partners. Right? And we have to expand selectively and strategically around economic interests. And one aspect of that would be clearly to have high-level talent come to this country, perhaps through the PASH network and similar things. Now, there are scenario-specific recommendations, but we also have cross-cutting ones. And the one I want to focus on most are um, the needed improvement of governance capacities. Right? Governance capacities at the moment are really not fit for purpose in our view. But what do we mean by that? Analytic governance capacity. Do we actually know uh, what we want? And do we have the data? Do we have the evidence uh, for it? There was no plan B right, to the situation that Constance uh, Scherzenberg described, Müller described so adequately. Right? There was no plan B. Right? And that should not be the case. Having not only a plan B, but having a plan C is part of the capacity to govern, and we have failed in that regard. Regulatory capacity, we should really step up the, our efforts to, uh, to uh, set norms for cyberspace, artificial intelligence, and of course also the red lines that are needed in, on, in the internet and in the social media. I think we just have to be more assertive in pushing that through with our European partners. We have to overcome uh, what we call the discordance between annual budget allocations and multi-year planned commitments. Um, every year this country goes through a little dance right, in, in, in Parliament, and to some extent I understand it, but uh, the Goethe Institute, for example, they have a, f they have a five or whatever year strategic commitment where that they have to do this, but they do not have the same financial support granted to act on that. So we go from, so we have multi-year projects with annual budget cycle, and that's not a good idea um, uh, in our view. And then we uh, propose much better coordination among the ministries here in Berlin kind of an inter inter interstitial committee, a standing committee that can make sure that ECP concerns are adequately coordinated with other parts of the German government. And it is our impression from having talked to a number of experts that this is not happening to the extent it should. So we make the proposal, let's improve the governance capacity of the German government to deal with the new situation out there and to make sure that soft power is adequately considered. So in conclusion, um, we view a hybrid of, the, of two scenarios as the most likely one, and that is the acrimonious deglobalization and Cold War, uh, Cold War 2.0. Right? And we are co convinced uh, that tensions will increase between the United States and China, and that w there will be some aspects of rival block uh, uh, block rivalries emerging, 
but they, we will not totally separate. And that's where acrimonious uh, globalization comes in, which means that we will have uneven uh, economic growth in quite a number of countries. Some countries are doing better, but most countries are doing less well. And the, uh, we will see, a, like in the, United, in the 1950s, a much bigger role for, of national governments in looking after the economic interest first of the nation first and foremost. And that means also uh, very likely greater in indebtedness of many countries in the OECD in, in particular. Right? So we must prepare ourselves much better uh, on how we can leverage soft power tools in a geopolitical environment that has radically changed. And we must answer um, uncomfortable questions. We must address them, even if we don't want to do that. And, and I think one way forward is to entertain uh, what, uh, what smart power would look like for this country. We have, of course, the notion of smart sovereignty. We have practiced that for decades now, and we are actually quite good at it within the EU. Right? We give up some of our sovereignty, but we gain smart sovereignty back. Can we come up with a notion of power that, is, that matches smart sovereignty? And with that, I'd like to thank you and apologize for the, uh, the hiccup here. But um, I hope you got uh, the main points that I wanted to share with you. Thank you so much. Helmut, thank you so much. I think we absolutely did get the main points, and uh, it was a very comprehensive uh, presentation with a lot to unpack. So without further ado, I will ask our panel to please join me here on stage, and I will introduce you when you are here. So, Torsten, if you will take the seat there on the left, and then uh, Judy, then Uta, and then Peter. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't ask, but shall we do first names to make it really snappy? Um, great. Okay. So I will start with, uh, if, by introducing uh, the gentleman on the left, is Thorsten Benner. He is director of the Global Public Policy Institute here in Berlin. And prior to co-founding it in 2003, he worked with the German Council on Foreign Relations. Judy Dempsey is a non-resident senior fellow at Carnegie Europe, and she's editor-in-chief of the Strategic Europe blog. She, has, she was the author of the book, The Merkel Phenomenon, and she has also reported for the International Herald Tribune and the Financial Times. Ute Frevert is director at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development, and she's founder of its Center for the History of Emotions. She sits on the governing body of the German National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina, and she will soon assume the presidency of the Max Weber Foundation. And finally, seated next to me, Peter Kettner is head of the Strategy and Planning Division for Foreign Cultural Policy at the Federal Foreign Office, and his 21-year career in the Foreign Service has included postings in Almaty and Ankara. So welcome to all of you. I'd like to begin by getting everybody's take on what we've just heard. Amongst these four scenarios, I wonder if you could share with us where you think we are now and where you think we're heading, and then very briefly, if you would, whether there are other options that, I believe it's football that we must be hearing period periodically. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but we're not gonna think about that. So, and then, it, you know, if you think there are other scenarios that are more plausible, I'd also be very curious to hear about that. And then in a second round of discussion, I want to dig a little bit deeper on implications for soft power or cultural and educational policy. So starting with Torsten, please, your thoughts. First of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Helmut, uh, for presenting the study, and uh, congratulations also to your co-authors, Christoph Yuking and Edward, for really terrific uh, work. I think it's, it's excellent and thought-provoking, and I don't necessarily want to second-guess the individual scenarios and where we're headed. We, we don't know. It's, uh, as you say, it's more an art than a, than a science. I would 
just like to point some to some positive uh, possible alternatives uh, from which we could start thinking about this or like it, it got me thinking in, in that way I just returned from India yesterday I thought if they listened to this presentation they would probably think it's a little German centric you know this Zeitenwende happened all because of us and, and it, it, it's all about us mostly and I think if you and it's a, it's about us and the US and China uh, the everybody else just gets fit, fitted into a box and I think what Olaf Scholz says about uh, where the world is headed and I'm, there I'm in agreement with him is that uh, and I think you say it also at some points is that there are many countries uh, who will kind of seek to shape their own destinies and will not neatly sort themselves into any sort of scenarios <clears throat> and and we need to be you know successful economically politically and also culturally by is you know establishing deeper ties with these with these countries some of the major players india indonesia other countries south asia brazil and you name it these are all countries uh, nigeria south africa and, and many others that will shape this century in a, in a way where we say like they will co-shape uh, the the uh, our dealings with the climate crisis and 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 uh, they will shape norms and co-shape and uh, there's a little i mean i i think the emp if i had to put an emphasis and where you say how how do you leverage uh, soft power tools for security and economic purposes i think give them a lot of freedom but al you know set priorities by reinforcing that uh, you take over the Max Weber Foundation they do a lot of excellent work but I would think the Institute that you started in India I think that's something to build on and uh, to say you know we should go more into these countries where we are pretty weak in, in terms of how we're anchored there and that will support whatever whatever uh, we're doing on uh, what we need to do on the security and uh, and uh, economic front and i think we need to start from the realization that we don't have as the west or as germany a lot of credibility in many of these uh, many of these countries in terms of our record more recent record past past record and and so on and i think uh, this reckoning is not only with our recent foreign policy i mean you had this one sentence that got me thinking in the in the in the report toward the end that uh, yes germany needs to account uh, for its wrongdoings but it shouldn't distract us from the future i think it's a it has been our asset to actually combine the the two and i wouldn't see a dichotomy but i think we've been a little myopic or like too focused on one aspect and to deal too little with our colonial history, so I think we should invest uh, in, in, in that. I'm, I'm just going to suggest uh, yeah, yeah. that you so, maybe dig deeper on that uh, in a later yeah, yeah, round. Yeah, I um, will. Great. Thank you. Sorry, didn't mean to just, you know. It, it, no, that's your job. <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> Judy, your thoughts as well, yeah, if you would. I'm and, I, you know, I was looking at some of your recent writings, and I saw the article that was quite recent saying that still uh, uh, maintaining some of its illusions about uh -huh. China and Russia yeah. and you mentioned uh, one of those being the continuing illusion of Wandel durch Handel so I wonder what you think about the assumptions of the report that in fact um, we're likely to see mm. a China German rapprochement as mm. one of the most likely scenarios Ooh. Three minutes. Is this on? How do I? It's on. It should it's be on. on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me, even though it's Friday night, and I think there's a football match as well. And I'm sorry that Germany. Well, we didn't get through either. We never made it actually. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not talk about that element of Germany. Um, the report. Um, I. I have a. I have a. I have a problem with the report. Um, and I think um, the main issue I have with it and it's packed with lots of ideas and recommendations in that it lacks the very essential two words, uh, change and human rights. There's a reference to human rights, but it's sort of passing. But the human rights must build into the cultural element and the society element. And when we talk about human rights, human rights should not be top down. It has to be down right in the grassroots and feeding up. 
and we've made lots of many mistakes in the past about dealing with civil society movements, especially in the Middle East. We saw this before the Arab Spring, and I fear we may be making the same mistake again by focusing too much on the state-backed civil societies. It's changing, which is very good news. It's changing how, look at the role of civil society in Ukraine. This is the first point. And the second point is, I, I, what Belinda asks me, I wonder, I wonder does the status quo here really want change? Because there's a great fear of change. And what we've seen over the decades is in dealing with China, dealing with Russia, United States, and so on. But I'm just not convinced intellectually that um, the change is being internalized yet and it's going to demand far more communication on all the levels that you raise. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll go right over to Uta. And I wonder uh, also about your, uh, your response to what Judy just said, given that you are a historian of emotion. And of course, resistance to change is also about, about fear. Yes, but I'm also a general historian, and maybe I, I stick to those um, capacities before I go into the emotions. Now, uh, as a historian, I, I'm not so much in love as um, sociologists obviously are in these four-fold tables and schemes. You know, we have these four nightly, neatly um, distinguished areas or scenarios. Historians think more in terms of development, change, etc., not so much into you know, various variables that might come together or, or not. And historians are also not so much um, concerned about predicting or even you know, um, drawing up alternative futures mm -hmm. because uh, there, there are a lot of historical future studies around just now. And what they, what they tell us is that these, how, how to predict or how to imagine the future is much more about, the, again, emotions, the fears, the longings, the, um, the, the wishes, the desires, also the, uh, um, yeah, the anxieties of current people than about the future because the future can't be predicted. And that's my third point. Mm -hmm. It's not, as, as we all kind of experience in our own lifetimes, things happen that nobody would ever have thought possible. Think of the, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, but also think, you know, personally, uh, and not just personally, the February the 24th came as a big surprise. And of course, there had been some people who said, yeah, 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 it's the kind of the CIA said so, etc. They, they're they building up their, their forces. But, um, you know, Macron and, and Olaf Scholz went, uh, sat at this huge table and tried to talk uh, to Putin out of there. And there was no such thing as a determinism that forced Putin to act the way he did. And so... There is always this notion of, of uh, surprise and, and in, insert, uncertainty, utter uncertainty in, in how things develop. Mm -hmm. Now, um, this said, um, 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 yeah, this is, is just about my, my, my skepticism as to uh, this kind of uh, way into a future that we can't predict. By and large, I'm all for... Uh, fostering and, and enhancing and strengthening and, and lavishly funding your uh, um, kind of cultural policies in, in many ways. And that's something that I found a bit lacking in the report. The report had a bias towards um, you know, this kind of more narrow sense of science diplomacy, all the fields that you mentioned, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, biotechnology, green, uh, green Deal, are all leaning towards the science side here. And I was lacking the, the, the soft power, or the mentioning of soft power, of humanities, uh, of arts, you know, sometimes alluded to, but not very much in the forefront. And also the Goethe Institute, they do much more than just teaching the German language. And I, sh I think they should do uh, go beyond beyond language acquisition and um, and yeah, I, I think I, sh I stop here. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. It's on. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, just just to continue a little bit on the same path. Um, when I was posted to Kazakhstan, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization was founded, and everybody was going like, "What is this? 
I mean, why do they do it? Because it doesn't make sense. It's just something nobody needs. And 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 what you were pointing out was like they could be a player. Um, so ne ne nobody predicted that. It was it was really ridiculous at these times. Um, same goes for my other posting, Ankara. Uh, when you look at Turkish politics, especially um, foreign politics, there's always a really astonishing turnaround tour because um, every once in a while, two months or three months or whatever, um, Erdogan changes the the enemies he needs um, and, and there's no such thing as any kind of predictability so you you're not able to to predict any kind of scenario because you never know what what's going to happen next next day maybe or two months time and the same goes a little bit for what you said about february 24 um in a way this was from my perspective this was not very rational i mean um russia was in a quite strong position before they invaded ukraine and afterwards from my perspective, they're not. So from my perspective, um, this was not a very smart and logical step. But so, so to predict it is, and, and to, to predict these kind of futures is barely, I would say, impossible. And um, when it comes to what, what can cultural diplomacy do, I think this is more about, I mean, we're, by, by, by shaping cultural diplomacy, we're trying to give the layer, the basis of, what what can what can be built on um, the relations we have with that cultural diplomacy um, by by establishing contacts between societies between people um, and that may help to establish stronger political for, uh, and and further going economic re relations. But if I can just ask a, yeah. a follow. sound like it, does it? It does? Okay, good. Um, a, a quick follow-up to that, it would be, um, you heard Helmut say that there was a sense that they believe cultural policy needs to be more integrated with the overall foreign policy direction and that that in, in turn should reflect the scenario type development that we see. Um, would you say that's already happening? Do we really need a kind of a Security Council to ensure that that does occur? I think in first place we need um, people talking about, um, well, security issues in Germany to recognize that uh, culture, education, science is part of that security approach. So if you're talking about a national security uh, strategy right now, um, I think it's utterly important to, to, to say that um, especially in the field of foreign politics, um, cultural diplomacy must be a part of that strategy, is, is a part of, or will be a part of that um, strategy. Um, and, and if it's about um, coordinating with other, not only ministries, but, but, but parts of the foreign office, like um, our political departments, um, I mean, we're doing that, but of course, we're not the only um, well, factors they have to take into account, of course. Um, and sometimes we're not the strongest players. <laughs> that's, I think that's normal. Um, but of course we're trying to raise the voice and from time to time um, we're able to surprise them. <laughs> I mean, for, I mean, for instance, we, we talked about with our um, with our uh, near Middle East department a few weeks ago, and and just told them the the numbers, the sheer numbers of of, of people learning German in the region, um, <coughs> which made an astonishingly high increase of of about I don't know sixty seventy percent within the last five years, and nobody knew about that. So so from time to time, it is really. Well, not only interesting, but but also important to to exchange on a more regular uh, basis, and and that's what what we try to do. Yes. Carson, actually, I'd like to ask all of us now to to dig a little bit deeper. Better. Yeah. Think so. Okay. 
all of us to dig a little bit deeper on implications for cultural policy. And Torsten, if I can just start by asking you about dealings with authoritarian states. Um, because you have said uh, in another context that uh, some of the prominent approaches, for example, to dealing with disinformation uh, from authoritarian states um, overestimate both the strength of authoritarian efforts, I'm quoting here, as well as the level of virtue and integrity that exists within democracies. I found that quite interesting. Can you tell us what you meant by that? <laughs> Thanks for digging, uh, digging that up. I, I think it's, it's uh, in relation to this talk about sharp power. Uh, that, that's a term that came into popularity once we saw the, that uh, the likes of Russia and China can also penetrate our information sphere and they can also build influence operations in, in our societies. And I just don't, I, I'm, I dislike that term sharp power for, you know, sharp power is, is what China and Russia do, soft power is what we do. I hope that our soft power approaches are being seen as sharp by the likes of Russia and China because, you know, we are advocating what we stand for. Uh, and, uh, and conversely, because sharp power often says it comes, you know, surreptitiously anyway, and uh, a lot of what's, what's uh, the influence of China it comes through open doors and uh, is enabled through lobbies. But anyway, that's, that's uh, why I don't necessarily like this, this term sharp power and, and, and soft power in, in, that, uh, in that context uh, so much because our short, soft power should be sharp vis-a-vis -vis authoritarian authoritarian regimes. I just wanted to say one, one minute on, because I, I loved your point about the future, uh, Professor Frevat, and I think, I think we should look at these narratives about the future as what do they tell us about the present. A friend, uh, a friend of mine wrote his PhD on the future of the Weimar Republic, what people then imagined, and I think we should think about what does it tell us about the present uh, that we imagine these futures, Russia, China, and what does it tell us about the authors of the report that you said the most convincing narrative, new narrative that you can come up should build on Macron's Europe that protects. I think is a very inward looking, not, not curious, you know, it's, it's a, by, it strikes me, I mean, future historians will probably say that's done by people who don't necessarily think they have a bright future ahead and just need to huddle and protect themselves in, in Europe and that don't curiously go out in the world and think they can co-shape and innovate and, uh, and, and so on with others. I'm just provoking a little bit, but I, I found it interesting that you said like this, this term that Macron invented because he's challenged from the extreme right and extreme left in his own country that you thought this should kind of be the slogan for us, uh, our narrative about our place in, in the world. I don't think it will fly with a lot of uh, our interlocutors uh, in, in the end because it will come, up, come across as fairly inward looking and not excessively curious about the rest of the, the world. Judy, you look like you want to respond to that, and please do, but then I also have another short question for you, if you don't mind. No, I'll be very brief. Um, um, this, this, um, this concentration on the cultural element is, and somebody linked it to security, and in some ways security and culture do go together in the sense that the cultural element and security has to be linked to the whole idea of resilience. And I think in this paper, I think I would have liked a little bit more of resilience because it is a kind of soft power. And we're not resilient on soft, uh, in, in this term. It's cybersecurity attacks on AI, on, you mentioned the whole Russian propaganda here, uh, disinformation, what the Chinese are doing. I mean, our soft power should be confident and we should be open about it. And the second point is on, on this element of security and culture. Um, I, I hope this doesn't sound really um, off the wall, but, but culture is linked, I have to go back to this, culture is, is linked to humanism and a human right. And what we are seeing in Iran and countries in the Middle East 
or what happened in, in some of the elections in Latin America, it's the universality of human rights. So what we have in this report is a German, naturally German-centric thing, but we mustn't lose sight when we talk about liberalism and democracy, these are universal values and the cultural element should take this in mind when we're discussing this in our relations with other countries. Thank you. Question. No, actually, my question was about resilience and, ah. and how uh, resilience uh, relates to essentially the beacon effect uh, of Western democracies. So you actually covered it. Therefore, I will move on to Uta. And, I um, can I go now? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, you can't. But, uh, but I do want to move on to Uta because I want to talk a, a, a minute about the essentially uh, the opposite of uh, resilience. Helma talked about the fact that soft power ideally should be making countries like us, other countries like us. But as we know, there's enormous mistrust in the West. Um, certainly, if you look at the vote in the General Assembly on whether or not to condemn Russia's uh, invasion, there were many countries that abstained or uh, voted against uh, the, Western, uh, the Western resolution to condemn. So there's a lot of mistrust out there. How can soft power best, do you think, be deployed to uh, try to build trust? Thank you, Melinda, for that question. Um, I think the first thing is to do to disentangle um, cultural policy from, you know, what you what you asked Peter about the um, integration of, um, of of security issues, economic issues, and cultural issues. And I think, yeah, that's fine. People should talk to one another within the ministry, but also between the ministries, because quite a num quite. You know, some money also comes from the BMBF for, for all these um, endeavors. So I, I do hope that you talk to one another. But uh, I would not like to see cultural policy as a kind of servant, a server to, or serve, serve, servant, servant, servant to these kind of uh, security or, or economic issues. And exactly because the future is unpredictable. And we don't know if... Ankara or Amati or um, uh, what, <laughs> any other uh, any, any other city, yeah, and any other city in the world will actually be the focus and the center of some new conflicts or some new opportunities also that might arise. So I would really kind of suggest to, to spread uh, these efforts of cultural diplomacy and cultural cooperation pretty wide and also include, and I come back to what Torsten said in, in his first intervention, um, also come back to these these uh, difficult friends or difficult partners, and we can't always choose whom to cooperate with. I mean, we could, but it would not be wise to choose. We also have to have a presence in a country like India, where um, democracy is really kind of under threat at, at this very moment, and the, the country is, is marching into a direction under the... Um, um, uh, BHP government that is that is very detrimental to diversity, to uh, Muslim Hindu cooperation and collab and and coexistence. But we can't. We have to have a presence there. We will also have to have a presence. Go back to Russia uh, once yeah, that war will be over because we can't, just can't afford to to let any country drop off the map. Because I absolutely agree with, with you. It's not just a bipolar world, a new bipolar world that we that we're drafting between you know Washington and Beijing, and maybe with Brussels and Berlin kind of sneaking into that relationship. It's much more. It's much more multipolar. Let me pick up on, on two aspects of that, if I can. And uh, Peter, Chancellor Schultz recently suggested that Germany sh needs to resist a division of the world into blocks. He has an article coming out in Foreign Affairs soon, which essentially uh, says that. And then, uh, uh, again, it's uh, something he said before, need, that Germany needs to build new partnerships to counter such a, a development. So what tools of soft power would you say are most fit for that purpose? And to what degree can Germany do more to link its efforts up 
You said Berlin and Brussels, uh, Uta, and uh, you know, how much cooperation is there with other EU member states and the EU on this? Or is it really, as somebody said, German-centric? Well, um, <laughs> um, maybe just, if you allow me, just one comment to, to what you've said just um, about, um, about this um, disconnecting between well, foreign policy and, and cultural policy. Um, I, I think that the, the German system, the German system of cultural diplomacy is very much or is based on the independence of, of the players that we work with. And that is something that is quite unique but, but also very important for us, um, because we know that the strength of the German system is, is really in that independence. So, um, yes, we have political aims like climate foreign policy, like feminist foreign policy, um, and we can share that with our partners, and we can tell them that's the way we want to go, the direction or the, um, the star we want to follow, but... Um, but they're independent in the, in the way they do it and, and how they do it and if they open up institutes in, or if, if, they, if they do this and that. Um, and this is very good because we're not experts in that field. Um, and, and, and as concerns resilience, and I think we cannot overestimate the role of, um, of culture. We cannot overestimate the role of, um, of, of institutes like the Goethe Institutes in countries where um, people working in the cultural sphere are under pressure. This is something, I mean, these safe spaces are really needed. And um, especially if, if we look on the, on the places that have been shut down, like Minsk or, or, or others, um, it shows that these are the places where, where, we, yeah, where we need engagement for civil society the most. Um, okay, but... Coming back to your question, sorry. That's uh, right. Actually, <laughs> you know what? I will briefly step out of my moderator role because yeah. the Deutsche Welle is an actor of cultural policy. It was in Helmut's presentation. And when I think about how we work, it is exactly what Peter just described. We do not think what would fit in. First of all, it's a common misconception about the Deutsche Welle. We are government funded, but we are entirely independent. We have never received threatening messages from the chancellery or the foreign, uh, the foreign service about what we are doing in our programming. Every week we do a talk show, which I often moderate, that is about the Ukraine war. And we question the German government's policy repeatedly every week because we believe that by doing that we show the strengths of liberal democratic debate and that that is cultural policy. Walking the talk. Uh, walking the values. So for me, um, again, if even if there were a security council that said this is what the Deutsche Welle ought to be doing, I'm not sure the Deutsche Welle would take that on board. Anyway, that's just... Uh, no, no, you're right. Yeah. And, 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 and there's one, one example, and because we talked about well, a few weeks ago in, in the ministry, we discussed about the point, um, what is German about German cultural diplomacy? And we had that... Um, Deutsche Welle example of the 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 top the talks you do or talk discussions you do in the in the Arab world, um, and and we asked the guy, okay, what is what is German about um, the format you're you're actually doing, and 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 basically what what he said was like that I can talk about the subjects I do talk about, so that I can talk with people about being homosexual, um, that I can talk about pe with people about um, how they think about birth control, things like that. And that is German. Um, and, and in that sense, this is a very strong um, impact that we, that we might have um, on people's mindset uh, without mentioning the word Germany, um, which, uh, I mean, I remember when I started working for the first time in, in, in the cultural department 15, 17 years ago already. Um, the British Council made a shift from representing Britishness or <laughs> uh, talking about Great Britain um, towards a, an approach where they just had um, five, I think it was five issues they would talk about, five political aims. Um, and, and they would never have to, to mention 
that, that there was any kind of connection with, with Great Britain at all. So, um, so, so that would be, in, I mean, of course, there's a difference between, um, between Germany and, and, and Great Britain in that respect because um, everybody learns English without, well, without Great Britain doing anything for that. But, but nonetheless, I think in the end, if we focus on certain policy aims, um, like human rights, like um, feminist foreign policy, climate change, uh, things like that. This is in the German interest. This is this is German interest, and, and this is German cultural diplomacy. Thank you. I would say we take some audience questions now, and then I want to come back for a final round a little bit later about your recommendations uh, for where you think uh, Germany's soft power should be deployed in future. But who in the audience would like to pose a question? to the panel. Okay, in the uh, last row on the left-hand side, also last row on the right-hand side, and then uh, here is second row, I believe. We'll take two or three and then get some answers. And tell us who you are, if you would. Um, I'm Tanvir Kabir, a counselor of political from the Embassy of Bangladesh in Berlin. So I have basically two questions, one is, you know, I would like to know how the feminist foreign policy could fit in to the soft power strategy of Germany. And the second would be if we look into the U.S. foreign policy, U.S. soft power, you know, they have Hollywood, they have, you know, the democratic values, freedom of thought. So how do you see Germany in, in that kind of perspective. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I'll just take, I'll just take one more here on the other side. Uh, yeah. I'm a bit late uh, for the lecture, but uh, i just like to hint on some issues. As I feel a lot of what is talked about here is play with words. I was exercising soft power for many years as an ambassador of the European Union. And I tell you, we gave up on this uh, term. And for 10 years, we speak about smart power. We speak about normative power. And we have realized that if you, don't, if you speak only about soft power, uh, it leads to a lot of misunderstandings. The other side perceives our soft power as a kind of hybrid war. I was chairing the EU China human rights dialogue for many years. And all our ideas about human rights were seen from the Chinese side as a kind of hybrid war against their understanding of human rights. So with soft power alone, you cannot uh, achieve much. I'm sure we would be in a better position if we would have been to the second round of the football championship. <laughs> because exercising soft power at the beginning and then losing on hard power or sharp power, uh, it just questions your position overall. And also, speaking about Germany in the EU, our soft power has uh, been on the defensive. You know, the EU, Germany, lost very much as a trade power one of the most important parts of soft power. And I don't like to speak about Goethe Institute and Deutsche Welle, which I have seen and witnessed when I lived abroad. And I tell you, the image of Deutsche Welle and uh, Goethe Institute is much better in the country of origin than it's in the countries where it should uh, make a difference. Uh, I know so many people who have queued, who have queued to get in expensive courses of uh, Goethe Institute, there was no place. Uh, I know of people who told me, I hope to improve my German when I look at Deutsche Welle. But Deutsche Welle has no idea about subtitles, for example. Uh, they try to uh, communicate German soft power in China in English. So just to uh, hint to some issues, if we don't develop soft power to smart power, I think we will uh, not achieve anything much. Thank you. Let me ask Peter to speak to the first uh, two questions, and you know, of course, something there too, if you wish. 
Yeah, I was also about to say that um, um, what is, I mean, Germany's answer to to, um, to U.S. soft power. Um, so we used to say it's football, <laughs> <laughs> um, but but this is over. No, um, no, but but start starting with the with the first question: feminist foreign policy and. Um, and and I, I I don't use the, the the term soft power, but but I talk about cultural diplomacy at that point. Um, actually, what we're trying to say is um, what we're doing in our cultural diplomacy efforts is already um, a lot of what um, the colleagues in other departments are trying to do now with uh, implementing uh, feminist foreign policy, because our aim is or our our task is not only to, to, to spread some kind of German message all over the world, um, but it's more to, um, to get into dialogue with people and to, to, to open up a dialogue about certain issues, um, which also means that we, that we listen to them. And that is something our minister explicitly said in her speeches or says in her speeches regularly. Um, we hear you. So that is something that is really, really, really in, um, important for understanding that concept and that mindset of, um, of foreign policy. Um, and that is something that we, that we use, I think, that we've been doing in, in, in cultural diplomacy for, for, for quite a long time because we moved away from that representative kind of cultural diplomacy 15, 20 years ago when Frank-Walter Steinmeier was foreign minister for the first time um, towards a, a, a dialogue-oriented um, uh, kind of cultural diplomacy. And, and basically, I, I'm not saying that we are already um, have well, we, we, that we already have a full-fledged feminist foreign policy in in our cultural diplomacy, and we can can be much better. We are tr talking about things like gender budgeting and, and things like that. Uh, we need we need to be much more diverse um, in in the, the the contents we reflect in the um, well in the mindset of the people that take about decisions about budgets. Um, and, and there's a long way to go. We're actually having a, um, a, a study case with the uh, German Institute for Integration and Migration here in Berlin um, that deals with um, excluding structures and procedures within our cultural diplomacy that has been going on for one year now and is going another half a year. Um, so, so we have to be better in that, but, but I think, we're, we're very, I think we, we have been doing that quite a lot. And I mean, if you ask people in, in other countries, what is Germany's soft power answer to the US? I think most of them would say, or a lot of them would say beer, Mercedes, um, things like that. And we're trying to, to be more precise about the society in Germany and that is much more diverse, that it's um, actually quite colorful. Um, and, and that is one of the, the tasks that we actually have in cultural diplomacy to show the, the colorfulness of, of Germany and the, the diversity. Thank you very much. So uh, responses on the second point, smart power, briefly if you would, because we have quite a few other audience questions as well. Ute, you wanted to speak? Yes, I would like to uh, answer to um, Mr. Ambassador, but also uh, link that to the question from the Councillor from Bangladesh. Um, when I was traveling, um, and for example in South Korea or in India, I always met people who told me how important, especially the Goethe Institutes had been and still are, in order to provide these safe spaces, these civic spaces that allow people from the country, from the host country, uh, that is under, say, as in, in South Korea for a very long time, under very author authoritarian rule, to meet and speak and enjoy also kind of free time and watch Fassbinder filme and what, what have you, but all kinds of things that brings them together. It's much more than language acquisition. It's really providing spaces to meet. And one of my best experiences was actually in Dhaka in Bangladesh a few years ago when I was there as a uh, guest uh, f from by, by the Goethe Institute and they hosted a huge party, a, a lovely party on the occasion of, uh, the, of October 3. 
Um, and so we all met um, on the rooftop and I met so many people. I met so many people who approached me and said, oh, Germany is such a wonderful country. I said, hmm, yeah, <laughs> great, <laughs> you see it this way. And how do you know? And then they said, well, we've been uh, to Germany as a, a fellow from the... Um, um, Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. Uh, we experienced Germany as a country that was extremely open to foreigners, uh, to South Asians, to other people. And I thought that's the best ambassadors that you ever that you can get. So every money, every euro that is spent on these kind of exchange programs in science, but also beyond science, is so well spent. Thank you very much. I will not say anything in detail about Deutsche Welle, except that we made a very conscious decision to move away from our German programming to English programming to reach more people with a German view of the world, but not necessarily in German. However, we do still have German language programming, and I would be very happy to tell you more about that decision, which was in conjunction with doing much more of our programming online where many people can also find German television if they wish it. So that was the reason we're getting lots and lots of positive viewer reactions and we have the best numbers we've ever, ever had in our broadcasting. So yeah, but anyway, more, more if you'd like to know about it. Now, anybody else want to speak to any of those points? Then I'll take a question from the lady in the second row here. Please raise your hand. And also from the gentleman in the back on the left and the lady in the, yeah. Uh, Berlin. I wanted to uh, make a short appreciative comment about the report, a short appreciative comment about the panel, and maybe return to one question that was posed. First, I, uh, there was a lot of bashing about imagining the future, how that's impossible to predict, but I wanted to recuperate, I really appreciate the report. It seems to me a very uh, impressive um, accomplishment. And to uh, recuperate a point Helmut made about how important planning is for governance, right? Of course, future is unpredictable, but part of uh, trying to govern means that you plan for A, B, C, D, and that means that you have to play these scenarios a little bit like a chess player, and that without that imaginative effort, governance uh, stop being, uh, you know, possible and, and just, uh, uh, or it becomes laughable. So um, I really appreciated the panel's point that culture should not become an instrument on policy, that it should not be instrumentalized, that there is something to be said about the freedom and the promoting humanities and promoting curiosity and learning for its own sake, and that that sort of circles back uh, uh, perhaps into the foreign policy uh, objectives on their own. So on this question, is it reasonable to contrast Europe that protects as a kind of defensive stance with curious open-minded Europe. I'm a Polish person. Um, Germany's promotion of openness and, and, and curiosity and sort of generosity toward Russia has come, you know, seen to many of us completely unrealistic and, and, and so full. It seems to be, I guess, the point I want to make is that soft power or whatever, cultural diplomacy and, and hard power, some kind of realism about security need to go together rather than uh, being opposed in such a way. Thank you. We'll pick up on that in just a moment. I have a question here in the second row, the lady with blonde hair. Can you raise your hand again? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sigrid Beigel, and I would like to follow the path of the podium. Um, but perhaps uh, contribute um, a more general idea. Uh, yeah, be, because I think the, the, the greatest mistake of the, what we have heard is that uh, cultural foreign policy is considered as a non-military arm of uh, foreign policy. And uh, the other uh, experiences say that the development and the direction of foreign uh, cultural policy in Germany goes in a totally different direction to a more universal idea of cultural policy. And I would like to contribute two other uh, examples. For example, the new house in New York is not a German cultural house, but it's a space for ideas. And another example is the Villa Sul in uh, Brazil. 
uh, which is dedicated to questions of the global south and not to German cultural uh, policy. So, uh, and therefore, I would like to discuss more general ideas about the difference between foreign policy and cultural foreign policy, because I think they have to follow total different, they have total different aims, and they, they have to, to follow a total Thank different logic. Thank you. I'm going to cut you off there because we're really running out of time. I have one more question here in the back. If you'll put your hand up, please. I think that's probably all we're going to be able to take. I'm sorry, but we can try to catch up with each other during the reception later. Oh, thanks very much. Um, my name is Mike van Fran. I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. One of the countries that uh, abstains um, at the General Assembly. Um, yeah, so I, I just wondered uh, maybe just to take these, uh, the football metaphor a little bit further. Sometimes it's necessary to lose in order to win. And I'm wondering about the extent. I'm on a for German right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'd like to, to you know, use it in, in the context of the assertion of human rights and democracy and, and feminist foreign policy and the like, all things which are about winning in some ways because it's about asserting particular kind of positions, which I think it's necessary to assert, but it's the way that we go about trying to win those particular wars. <laughs> I think that sometimes the way that two-thirds of the world kind of sees these things is that there's an element of arrogance in the way and hypocrisy in the way that these things are implemented and pursued which turns people off so that soft power becomes something that is alienating rather than something which is inviting. I mean, I, I, you know, from the context of Africa, when we deal with the Gandhi Institute and the like, quite often when we are putting in applications for funding, today it's culture and development, tomorrow it's the creative industries, the next day it's climate change and the arts, and so on. So policy changes all the time, and we panel beat our projects to fit in with the new policies that emanate from Europe as opposed to these policies being discussed and decided with us. If you decided things with us, you may do a lot more to win us over to your points of view than deciding things that should be done for us. Thank you, thank you very much. What I suggest now, because actually we are at the end of our time, is that we go straight down the panel, respond to whichever point you would like to respond to, and if you want, include one central recommendation about where you think German cultural policy should be going in future. So, starting with Torsten. No, th thank you, and uh, I want to clear up, I don't think any of us bashed uh, these scenario exercises at all, because they're creative exercises. We use them all the time, and I think they get you thinking, and that's what happened with all of us. It got us thinking, without thinking that we actually divined the future, uh, and uh, Helmut didn't even claim that. So I think we're all positive about this, and it's a great report, and it got us all thinking. Now, I think you gave us the motto for how we should ap approach this uh, with our with other people in, in the countries we work with and not setting us setting the agenda and uh, according to our latest fashion but really with a curiosity with co-shaping and is a is ultimately i think the best you know because you you said this thing how how can it best or better be integrated with economic and and uh, other broader geo whatever the fashionable term of the day is, uh, but it has to have geo and uh, goals. Uh, and I think the best best way is actually to leverage the, uh, the people we work with, but in a way that we're, we're independent, creative, open-minded, feed it, and I think the report makes the very good point, to feed the expertise back into our perceptions. That we shouldn't, we shouldn't have been surprised if anybody who has been to South Africa wouldn't be surprised by the stance and the lack of credibility we have in South Africa after we, you know, what we did during the pandemic and uh, our broader record and, and so on. It shouldn't be surprising, yet much of our foreign, po no, a lot of our foreign policy elite and public was a little bit surprised that not everybody was equally outraged uh, at, at this. So feed it, feed it back in, be innovative, creative uh, with new tools, new formats, and give them a lot of leeway to ex experiment. But the people-centric for me also means 
that uh, we do one thing, and I think that, uh, that I think that that is a, a small game changer for soft power, is to change our visa policy. It's absolutely atrocious, uh, and it's a drag on our soft power and our cultural diplomacy effort. The way we implement our visa policy, our visa offices are understaffed. They're mandated to actually keep people out much rather than to keep them in to kind of uh, to kind of dig deep uh, and much rather than swiftly you know enable others to come also to to Europe to uh, or, and to Germany to experience that so I think and it it actually hits exactly the you know because mostly the people with means who apply for visas uh, to to Germany. And I've heard so many stories that our kind of current practice, as mandated by our interior ministry and uh, uh, you know implemented by the foreign ministry, does a lot of damage uh, to our standing globally. And we really, with a priority, the, the interior minister and the foreign minister, I think they're on it. But the interior ministry needs to change the direction for us to actually be much more open uh, the way we want to be seen in, in the in the world with uh, with our visa policy and be seen as inviting and uh, that this also reflects our broader cultural policy thank you we'll go we'll go to judy but I maybe Peter brief. will and um, by the way interior ministers are all, are all made the same okay i mean they're all the same worldwide microphone, microphone. yeah oh sorry microphone and um, uh, two things i'd like to see in the report which um I read the whole thing and there was a lot of nuggets in there. One is I'd like more on migration that gets very little mentioned and migration is so crucial, uh, no matter where, but especially to Europe. That's the first thing. And the other thing um, I'd like is a little bit more on education. Uh, you, you brought up the education, but the Erasmus program is such a success. We could expand the German programs. You have the DAD and it is unbelievably successful. And there's so many, I know so many who've gone through it. Two other little points. I mean, if culture, if culture is being instrumentalized, we see how it's in instrumentalized, especially in Russia today, and film directors have been told what to do are just censored. There's so much censorship, and there's censorship in other parts of the world. We, you know, we all know these countries. We cannot allow, and it's difficult for you, I mean, and you cannot allow culture as culture to be hijacked. Um, and I'm not saying the foreign ministry is doing this. You made a really good point about people to people and dialogue, which answers the, uh, our colleague from Cape Town. And one last point, and I can't stress this enough, we cannot ever underestimate a safe place, whether it's the Goethe Institute or the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, all these stiftings all over the world and other, other places. Uh, the EAS ambassador was kicked out of Minsk and other... Um, other students because they gave a safe place and if you robbed and they were taken out because the regimes had fear and this is the big problem we must give a space so that people will not be suppressed by fear thank you again i can i can only second this but um i would also like to see you know when it comes to recommendations i would like to see not so much universal efforts, but European efforts rather than German efforts. I mean, we we have a strong European Union with some members that I that are probably not so much on the page of common values, etc. That must also be seen as as a problem and dealt with. But I've seen, I think it was in Atlanta, where the Germ the, the Goethe Institute uh, is on the same floor with the Alliance Française and with the British Council. They share the same rooms. Okay. The Max Weber Stiftung uh, in Beijing shares a, a space with a French organization. And I do think that we should, um, should move more towards a European um, cultural policy uh, rather than, you know, each country does it by itself, but also more and more hiding that they come from Germany or Britain because that poses other problems. And my suggestion, the final suggestion as to soft power, smart power, um, why not uh, put a lot of effort in bringing out women's soccer. I mean, men fail all the time, but uh, the, the women's soccer team is extremely, extremely su successful in Germany and, and also in other you. countries. Hmm? The English beat you, unfortunately. Did, oh. I, <laughs> I can live with that, but... <laughs> um, so why not invest more attention yeah. there? 
rather than in football, male made. Well, actually, that's what we do. Um, <laughs> no, because I, I mean, I, I worked in the in the unit that deals with uh, sports promotion within the the Department for Cultural Diplomacy, and and actually that is one of the of the the main objectives that we have to um, to foster the cooperation in in female sports um, because that is really a tool to to um, to make girls and, and and women participate in societies um, much better than, than than most of the tools we actually have um, just to come back to your to your question um, or first one thing is very important for me um, Cultural diplomacy is foreign policy. We are an integral part of foreign policy. There is no distinction between this. If, if ever we make up that distinction, um, I think we are running into a, a, a big problem because um, we have to prove um, the importance of what we're doing every day. And every day this is being questioned. Um, I think it's, it's the other way around. We have to make the point um, that that there is no distinction between, I mean, it used to be the, the, the cultural diplomacy used to be the third pillar of German foreign policy. And, and actually it's not. It's, it's, it's part of, of foreign policy, full stop. Um, and, and there is no first, second, something pillar, um, but, but it's an integral part, and we have to underline that every day. And this is really important. And if it comes to how is cultural diplomacy going to look like, it's, it's going to be, I, I hope, and, and, and I'm really convinced, it's going to be more inclusive, more diverse, it's going to be more di sustainable, and it's going to be more European. It has to be more European. Otherwise, um, on the long run, we, we're losing, um, we are losing our, our impact that we have. Um, but I think Germany is, as I perceive it, and I'm, I'm not saying that as a civil servant, but... Um, but uh, but as a private person, I, I, I think Germany is already a front runner in this, and we're trying to foster that on the European level. But as you said, it's 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 quite difficult to to act together. And we have that German Franco institutes already in some places, like Palermo was was opened last year. But but it's it's really well, it's not easy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much to all of you for those reflections and, uh, and uh, for this very far-reaching discussion. Let's give them a very warm round of applause, if you would, please. Thank you. And for some closing words, I would now like to hand over to Dr. Odile Triebel. She is Head of Dialogue and Research at the IFA. And after that, I will come back to tell everybody how they can continue the discussion more informally in a moment. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, it was um, a very intense um, and fascinating discussion uh, we could listen to, and it had two layers. The first one was the, the scenario, and back on this, the discussion on um, what how German external cultural policy um, might, might change and might look in the future. Um, I would like to remind that this, uh, this event was planned in the framework of the ECP monitor. And the ECP monitor was funded because actually the, the entire environment of international cultural relations um, uh, uh, um, changed a lot during the last decades. And I quote from the report, once the Cold War ended, countries such as Russia and China began to use soft power approaches specifically in the sense of a political economic positioning and invested massively in the expansion of the cultural institutes and foreign media. And so this for sure is, is a different context also that ha might have some impact on how Germany positions itself. And because of this um, um, changed environment, we thought it's very important, like with this um, ECP monitor, to, to make it accessible, some information about um, these kind of investments and ideas um, done in the field. Um, however, the, I admit that the evening um, didn't match up to the, my personal foresight of this evening, so my closely remarks uh, need some creative innovation from me right now, from the scratch. Um, but um, I like the discussion uh, very much and, and, and how, how it went. Um, so what I would like only um, 
because it was already in very intense discussion, um, to, to remind that um, I, I, I appreciate a lot the cooperation with the Hattie School, but like, an every, like a good cooperation, it's, it's a, a pluralistic cooperation with different point of views. And unlike um, Helmut Anheyer, we at IFA, we, we are very firm about that soft power is not the same as international cultural relations. And we make a very um, we make a, um, a very firm distinction between both, and the international cultural relation approach is very much in line with the the one the EU also took, and the difference is that it's based on trust and understanding and cooperation, and this is not only an idealistic view of some normative powers in the middle of Europe who have rely a lot on good relations in the world because of the economy. No, it has another context, and I would like to remind on this as well. It has a context in international law. And it was on, on the experience on a, of a very violent past that in the foundation document of the UNESCO, it says, that the wide diffusion of culture and the education of humanity for justice and liberty and peace are indispensable to the dignity of man and constitute a sacred duty which all the nations must fulfill in a spirit of mutual assistance and concern. And as Karma Benune, the former um, rapporteur on human rights for the UNESCO, also consistent, constantly um, um, affirms is that actually this was brought up again in the Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights in the Article 15.4 that it's really a duty of the countries to assist each other in this endeavor. And this is also a framework of international cultural relations. So on this background, I think one of my favorite sentences of the evening is actually this Botlighting of Helmut Anheyer on the federal budget spending of two billion that might be sh now be looked at in a different light. So I thank you all, the audience. It was an honor to have you here for a fantastic discussion. It was an honor to have you all, the audience here. And I would also like to thank the team of Hertie School and Eva, it's an honor to work with us and you made this evening possible. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Triebel. And dear ladies and gentlemen, you probably noticed uh, there are refreshments uh, and uh, drinks waiting outside in the foyer so that, foyer, so that we can indeed uh, continue our conversations informally. I would like to say thank you very, very much to our hosts and organizers for making this discussion possible, for putting together the very, very interesting uh, Foresight Scenarios report. And uh, also to you, dear ladies and gentlemen, we've gone over time. Thank you for your attention uh, throughout the discussion and for your contributions. Greatly appreciated. It was a wonderful discussion. Goodbye. Enjoy the evening. <laughs>